Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. I am Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics, returning um, after two weeks of Ohio funk uh, to join you on this lovely um, April 9th, 2024. Um, I'm joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst and friend of the show, friend of DAT. We have Tim DeNoyer from ACT Research joining us this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you with us, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tim, did you get much of the eclipse yesterday? You're a little bit west, right? We were right in, right in the totality for, we had a good three and a half minutes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, I was joking that it was just souped up shade, but it actually was pretty awesome to, to actually see it. It was actually kind of a surreal experience. It was really extraordinary. It was stunning. I don't know about where you are, but like the tree frog started going where we are. The birds went into like night mode. It was very, very quiet, um, almost that's chilly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, saw that. I could see where like 300 years ago, People were like, <laughs> what ex- what ex- what's happening right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Dean, you didn't get any of it, right? Up where you are? It was No, it was just like a cloudy day. Yeah, I got yeah. I got sunburnt watching it because it was our first sunny day in four months. Yeah, I got sunburnt as well. It was cloudy in the morning, but it, it cleared up. So yeah. um, hey Tim, do you want to give folks I know you're uh, on quite often, but for folks who may not have uh, joined when you've been on, can you give folks an intro um, on your role and and what ACT's position is on the industry? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Act Research is, is a uh, commercial vehicle data analysis, forecasting and consulting firm. Uh, basically anything commercial vehicle economics, uh, you know, we try to cover. It's the quick version. Awesome. All right. We've got a lot to cover this week. It's TIA week. Uh, a bunch of us will be descending on lovely Phoenix, Arizona uh, later this week um, to be with all of our best friends in the brokerage industry. Um, so with that, I'm going to get us rolling and then we'll bring Tim back um, for a lively discussion um, after we get through our market update. So what's going on in the wired world of freight? Um, so spot rates are flat for all equipment types uh, to start the second quarter. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of room uh, between 2019 and uh, current rates, not much. We're talking a couple of pennies here and there. Um, Dean will dive into that in more detail, I'm sure. Drive van replacement rates are down 2.4%, active rates down 1.7. Um, the PMI coming out of ISM is up two and a half points. First time manufacturing activity has been in expansion territory since October of 22. That also correlates to the first time we're seeing positive net motor carrier authorities um, on an interstate basis since the same time frame. Uh, preliminary TEU imports up 4% in March, 23% year over year. Um, and then what I suppose we'll be talking quite a bit about with Tim, new truck demand wanes in March, orders down 38% month over month and 8.6% year over year. That I'll turn it over to Dean to walk us through the market update. Dean? Yeah, thank you, Ken. All right, so let's start with dry van load to truck ratio. Um, following last week's month end increase in shipping volume, sorry, the prior week, um, load post volumes dropped back last week as they typically do down 11% last week, still about 14% higher year over year. Uh, ongoing interstate carrier exits that Ken mentioned uh, continues to result in a decrease in capacity in the spot market. Uh, load to truck ratio uh, down slightly to 3.64 last week. In refrigerated, uh, low post volumes down also last week, down 18%, uh, dragged down by the 4% week-over-week decrease in the volume of truckload produce moving nationally. Uh, But we are at the start of produce season, and compared to this time, volumes are about 8% lower, so not too far behind where they need to be for us to have a decent shipping season. Uh, Load to truck ratio down 12% to 4.70 last week. And in flatbed, uh, flatbed load post volumes were flat last week, increasing Uh, after increasing for the prior seven weeks, a little bit of flattening out there, still about 10% higher than last year. Load to truck ratio up slightly to 22.08 last week for flatbed. Having a look at some of our markets, uh, tight capacity in Seattle last week was fairly obvious, not a huge market, but significant for carriers looking for that southbound load back to Los Angeles and Ontario. Um, There was an 8% increase in outbound line haul rates last week. Volume of loads moved was down though, so capacity was tighter. Uh, rates are up about nine cents a mile higher, still at about a dollar forty-six a mile. A lot of activity in Spokane uh, out to the east. Spot rates are up four cents a mile to two sixty-eight. Um, longer haul loads out of Spokane uh, paid carries about seventy cents a mile, though. So rates, were, sorry, out of Seattle, uh, rates are way down uh, on that lane and way below um, break-even on a round-trip basis for carriers running Los Angeles, Seattle, Los Angeles. 
uh, 70 cents a mile on the backhaul only gives them about a buck 50 a mile round trip rates so not healthy rates on that i5 lane uh, in the top four markets last week of our top five uh, rates were lower uh, rates were up on lower volume last week that's another indicator that spot market capacity is resulting in a rebalancing um, so rates um, you know up slightly but volumes down California outbound Los Angeles loads up four cents a mile to almost two dollars on eight percent lower volume uh, Dallas volumes drop nine percent week over week spot rates up two cents a mile to a dollar 46 uh, similar trend in Chicago uh, volumes were down 13% week over week. These are loads moved volumes. Spot rates up a penny per mile to $1.94. And in Atlanta, um, uh, volume of loads moved down 6% week over week. Spot rates up $0.02 cents a mile. In refrigerated, um, outbound Atlanta refrigerated capacity was tighter last week. Rates up $0.04 cents a mile to $2.03. Um, it's a fairly significant distribution market on the East Coast. Um, the loads moved volume down 12% and about 14% lower than last year. One of the number one lanes we look for in the reefer market as an indicator of the market is Atlanta to Lakeland. Uh, capacity loosened last week on 3% lower volume of loads move. Rates down two cents a mile to 277. Uh, remember folks, these exclude fuel, so these are line haul only. Uh, while we're in Florida, outbound Florida reefer rates dropped three cents a mile last week to $1.41, impacted by a very soft produce season. Uh, where according to the USDA, truckload volumes are about 41% lower following last week's 21% week-over-week decrease. Uh, we're still a ways to go out of the Florida produce market, though. It typically peaks towards the end of May. And in California, after a slow start, outbound produce volumes are improving. Uh, last week, they were up 17%. So we're looking for um, significant volumes to start changing the market dynamics in Reefer. Uh, Fresno is one of the biggest markets we watch. Uh, especially for produce, uh, rates up three cents a mile last week to two dollars and five on a two percent higher volume of loads moved. And lastly, in flatbed, uh, capacity remains tight in Baltimore. It's been a big flatbed move over the last few weeks. Naturally, it's one of our largest spot mo spot load markets uh, on the east coast this time of the year. Uh, rates have recently increased by twelve cents a mile um, following last week's four cent per mile gain to an average of two thirty four. Uh, volume of loads moved, increased by just over 1% last week. One of the big lanes we watch out of Baltimore is South Bend, Indiana. Load volumes were up 3% last week, while carriers were paid an average of 203. That's up $0.05 cents a mile last week. And in uh, the last uh, part of our market update, we look at the year-over-year -year look at spot rates. At $1.58 a mile, the national average dry van line haul rate has remained mostly flat for the last seven weeks. Compared to last year, line haul rates are about $0.08 cents a mile lower. And as Ken mentioned earlier, just $0.02 cents a mile higher than this time in 2019. In refrigerated, spot rates remained flat last week. They averaged $1.87. That's line haul excluding fuel. Even though the national volume of loads moved uh, decreased last week, uh, spot rates being flat is a good indicator of that capacity in that market is tightening. Compared to last year, rates are about $0.12 cents a mile lower. And just like dry van, sitting exactly two cents a mile higher than this time in 2019. And lastly, in flatbed, uh, after increasing for all of March, the volume of flatbed loads moved, dropped back last week, uh, down 15% week over week. However, capacity continues to tighten. Uh, flatbed spot rates up by just under a cent per mile last week, averaging $2.03. Uh, compared to last year, they're about 12 cents a mile lower. And as you can see on the green chart, they're almost identical to 2019, um, up by about a penny per mile. And that's it for the market update. As always, if you want to find out more about what's happening in freight and get a copy of all the charts and the commentary of today's market update, our long form version of the report will be published this evening. Go to dat.com forward slash market update. Back to you, Ken, uh, for the short term forecasts. <clears throat> Thank you, Dean. Um, so like we do each week, these are the short terms. Um, the blue line is the historical seven day weighted moving average. We go back to September here to give a sense of historical context. And then we have an ensemble of four models. Um, none of this includes fuel, which is important to note. We have red, which is a short term model. Green is rate cast, which is in all of our products. And then a gray and a yellow, which are blended models that kind of straddle the fence between long and short term. Um, and what you see is a, a a great bit of model disagreement here. And something we don't talk about a ton, um, but I think it's worth mentioning here is that one of the inputs into the short-term rate cast model is real-time or near-time MCI, um, our market conditions index metri uh, metric. And when we're seeing a pronounced softness there, um, that's one of the signals rate cast will take um, and react accordingly. So it's pushing rates down a bit. Um, 
down to where they were before the run up um, in during peak season. I don't think that's very likely to continue. Um, that MCI metric tends to flip um, seasonally uh, pretty quick when it does when the market does start moving upwards. Um, and I think that'll start pushing rate casts up and up and up as the market gets into its seasonal swing. Um, I'll counterbalance that with saying the short term models sensing any sen- any kind of strength in the market. Um, any kind of rate movements, even if there's a few pennies upwards, and then extrapolating it out to a broader trend. Um, realistically, I even think the blended models are a bit pessimistic here. If we if we follow that pattern and don't see meaningful rate upward rate movement until um, the second or third week of May, I think that's going to be a pretty big downer for most folks um, tracking and moving freight in this market. Uh, certainly, shippers will like it, but everyone else, I think, will be pretty um, pretty bummed about that. Uh, let's go to reefer. Uh, this is where you're seeing almost everything follow a similar trend. So this is where um, the short term model isn't seeing those recent upticks in price. And it has nothing to really extrapolate off of, which is why you see things mainly in alignment uh, towards the tail end of this forecast. You do see almost all the models turning upwards. That's just the strong seasonal pressure for uh, refrigerated getting into May. Uh, flatbed, um, probably the most boring of the three. Um, Raycast has it coming back a little bit, maybe a few pennies and then leveling off. And then the other three models are in agreement that we just essentially stay here. Um, and then as the weather really warms for good for the summer, um, it starts to trend upwards uh, heading into May. So with that, we'll bring Tim back and go to our question of the week. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, so Tim, uh, demand for new trucks slowed significantly in March, as we talked about at the top of the show. What's that telling you about the state of the truckload market? It's a great question. It's a, there's a lot, lot in there. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I guess the simple answer is it, it matches up with the softness that we've been experiencing in the truck market for, for quite some time. Unpacking it a little bit more, what we've been really surprised about, um, frankly, for the last six months or so, is just, just quite how, how strong uh, truck orders have been. Um, and we've gone through a normal uh opening of the order boards uh, since last September. Uh, and so there's a normal seasonal uptick uh, towards the end of the year and, and the beginning uh, of the, the upcoming year uh, for orders to be placed, uh, which came in you know, until March uh, above our expectations. So uh, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a lot of questions that I hear in the market about uh, you know, why has capacity been hanging, hanging around so long? Uh, I think that's kind of the wrong question. I think the, the right question is, is uh, you know, why are, fleet's still buying a lot of new trucks. And, and um, a lot of that comes down to longer term planning uh, ahead of emissions uh, regulations that are coming up in, um, in a bigger way in 2027. Uh, but uh, there has been a lot of uh, private fleet expansion over the, the past year or so that I think has, has pulled some freight out of the, the for hire market and, and sort of lengthened this downturn. Hmm. And I think that's starting to, to change. That, that The real key is, um, <clears throat> is Orders of lower orders suggest that demand is normalizing. And so the supply in the market is starting to shift from, from sort of an oversupply to something more, you know, reasonable. Uh, and while the financial pressure continues on, on these small carriers, I know that, you know, new operating authorities did, you know, in, you know rise recently. Uh, but uh, I think overall that pressure is continuing and capacity is continuing to, to generally tighten. That's what we hear from the fleets that we survey. And, uh, I think that that market balance is getting very close. Hmm. So, Tim, talk a bit more about the increase in private fleet numbers because that's kind of counterintuitive. Normally, this time in a market cycle with spot rates so low, you would expect to see a shift back towards spot market fleet. So, can you talk about what's driving that? If you have some theories on why sure. uh, shippers who have private fleets might be increasing their truck counts. Sure. Yeah, we, we th- think the 2027 um, low NOx emissions regulations in particular uh, are driving some private fleet uh, expansion. Um, there's a new set of, of emissions rules that are going to affect heavy duty trucks, uh, the GHG3 rules that were just finalized uh, by the EPA last week. Those are going to add uh, additional um, zero emission vehicle requirements, uh, essentially, uh, in 2028 and beyond, uh, but for 2027, there's there's basically going to be a, a large increase in the uh, the cost of a of a diesel truck, uh, and fleets want to get ahead of that. 
Um, private fleets in particular, I think, uh, who have long trade cycles um, really want to reduce the average age of their, their fleets ahead of that. And I think that's one of the things that's been going on really since last year. Uh, I think there's been so, so, a little bit of pre-buying. Um, these, these regulations that are going to be national in 2027 are uh, impacting California um, as of this year. So, uh, these engines are available and they're out there. Um, Cummins, for example, um, has a the, their 2027 uh, compliant engine uh, available today. Uh, we don't expect anyone to, not many people to uh, <laughs> really pay out a lot for an engine that's untested and, and um, I mean, it is cleaner, but uh, uh, but it's the cost increase, a lot of it's gonna come down to uh, the warranty and useful life uh, extensions that are in these regulations. And, and so <clears throat> the corollary really is um, a lot like 2007, um, the EPA regulations that went into effect back then uh, drove a pretty major pre-buy. And we think you know, there's, there's some of the same sort of purchasing activity going on right now. Hmm. I guess the good news is my uh, pre-emission 20-year-old C15 Caterpillar value just went up. So. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that thing can go up anymore. That thing's you know, priceless. <laughs> well, I just painted it, so it's probably worth a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> they go better when they look shinier. Um, Tim, yeah. talk about California. One of the things, that their EPA regs are much tougher over there. Are you seeing any difference from California compared to the rest of the lower 48 states? Oh, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right that it's much more um, stringent. Uh, they have a couple of different sets of rules that, that they're going after, not just the low NOx rules, um, but uh but the advanced clean trucks and advanced clean fleets are, are what they're they're calling these other two rules that essentially force um, zero emission vehicle adoption uh, at, at sort of growing intervals over time, um, and those are you know much more strict than what we're seeing at the national level. We will eventually see the GHG three rules uh, that were just finalized at the national level will eventually adopt a similar kind of rollout, um, but really mostly in the next decade. Not you know, most of that happens. Um, for day cabs, it starts in 2028, and for sleepers, it doesn't start until 2030. In terms of the this push on the OEMs, uh, to the sorry, the truck manufacturers to uh, to start building more and more uh, zero emission vehicles. Um, that happens more uh, sooner on the on the medium duty side, but when we're talking heavy duty trucks, um, it, it is a little further out uh, nationally. But but some of this is happening. Um, particularly the ports, I think uh, the rule is from, from here on out, um, a considerable percentage of, of the trucks uh, registered at the ports will need to be zero emission. Yeah. Um, Tim, one of the things I've struggled with in the last few years, and I think others have too, is the meaning of new truck orders as it relates to future truckload demand as being a, I'll, I'll use the word reliable indicator. I think it still is, but it lost its meaning last year in particular with with uh, you know the backlog the semiconductor chip shortage can you speak to uh that difference over the last few years and are we heading back to a period where truck has become that wall street indicator from your days on wall street where it's a really good indicator of large truckload capacity demand uh, uh, capacity sorry on the supply side yeah, it's a great question. And and the, the backlogs got so long during the pandemic that you're right, it was it became very difficult to interpret. Uh, but I think the, the relationship is normalizing. That long-term relationship where uh, truck orders tend to follow spot rates, um, I think that's happening again. Uh, and I think those softer orders that we saw in March uh, are sort of normalizing that, uh, you know, following the uh, the truckload cycle lower. Mm -hmm. And and that change in the supply dynamic should be um enough to you know, turn spot rates higher. Uh, I do think this economy is strong enough. It, it really is that change in supply that, um, that we think is really critical to the, the whole equation. And so I think that the, uh, the relationship is, is normalizing. You're right that, that it sort of broke down during the pandemic, during the, the, uh, the supply chain crises. It was, it was just um, you know, rates went off the chart and uh, the manufacturers essentially couldn't uh, accept orders because uh, they were so constrained. So that, that broke the relationship, but that uh, really has been repaired. And, and uh, we are uh, a few years on from, from that. And uh, what's, we're, we're still a little bit surprised at how uh, much demand there is for, for new equipment. Uh, it's falling, uh, but it's still a little bit above what we call replacement levels. So at the moment, current sales levels of, of new heavy duty trucks are still 
adding a little bit to the fleet, maybe like a thousand or two thousand trucks per month at the you know current selling rate this year. Um, that was adding a lot more last year. Uh, and as as we continue to normalize down uh, over the course of this year, we think we'll get back to replacement levels or, or maybe a little bit below. And so we'll stop adding capacity to the fleet. And, and that's really the key. Uh, and that's that that change from last year, we sold more new trucks than, than ever before. There's two hundred and eight thousand uh, class eight tractors sold in the U.S. Uh, last year, which was an all time record. So. Uh, we're gonna we're looking at something like 160 this year, so so that's much more in line with uh, with what we need to replace for the fleet each year. We're still gonna add a little bit, uh, but uh, that's really the key from a from a market supply perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, any headlines from your CAS report that I don't think has been released just yet, unless I've missed it. I actually still don't have the the <laughs> glad I don't have it because it, has, it hasn't been released yet, but I still don't have the. Uh, the March CAS data, but what I would, I mean, our expectations are, are to see continued gradual improvement. We're seeing good evidence on the railroads. We're seeing good evidence on import volumes uh, right. that, um, you know, those green shoots have been with us for a little while, but uh, uh, they're continuing. And I would, I would expect that the CAS index to, uh, from a volume perspective, to continue to, right. to inch higher. Right, right. Um, I'll ask one more question. I've been hogging the show here, but um, uh, talk about new truck orders uh, by category, right? So we've got class eight sleepers, but we've got a lot of activity in the vocational truck market, right? Where a lot sure. of the freight moves. What are you seeing any difference in the six, seven, eight categories? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, medium duty is pretty pretty steady. Where we do see some really strong demand still, and and some really long backlogs. Even still, that that relationship, you know, is still sort of broken, I guess, if you will, uh, from the pandemic uh, between you know demand and orders because in the vocational markets, class eight uh, vocational trucks, uh, dump trucks, cement trucks, refuse trucks, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, the bodybuilders are still very constrained in general. And so it's still the, the long lead time for, for that equipment. Uh, and so overall production of that equipment should hold up um, a good bit better than, um, than the tractors. Um, within tractors, you're seeing a little bit more strength in day cabs relative to sleepers, which is normal at this point in the cycle too. All right. Is it uh, body body builders, if that's the right term? Is that because of labor constraints or um, raw materials? I think at this point it's more labor than raw materials. Yeah. Right. right. <clears throat> it's overall just, yeah the capacity. I think yeah the, it takes it takes a long time to to ramp that capacity up. Gotcha. Tim, I don't. This is a very naive question. I'm more just curious if you know the answer. Um, Friends of mine who have small businesses or real estate businesses towards the end of last year uh, rushed out to dealerships to buy like Lincoln Navigators or Ford Expeditions or Escalades because they're over 6,000 pounds, I think it is, because they could, there was a tax pull forward where they could write off the entire thing in one calendar year as opposed to depreciating it. Does that apply for large fleets buying Class 8 equipment? That's a great question. Uh, I think in some places, maybe I, I, I don't have a great answer for you. But I, I know, you hear about that a lot with with farm and construction equipment. Um, there are some accelerated depreciation tax laws, but I can't say I'm a tax uh, expert. <laughs> I never want to be. I just as I'm sitting here thinking, like I've been ruminating on why people are still buying trucks, and I think a lot of that. You mentioned, you know, we're just above replacement rate, and average fleet age is about normalized in most of the public fleets anyway. And it just kind of keeps itching at me a little bit that there might be some underlying tax incentive um, or some reason for them to offload this capital and uh, use it as driver recruitment. We all know that, right, The one of the biggest levers in a high turnover industry for driver recruitment and retainment is age of equipment mm -hmm. and the bells and whistles in the cap, right? So um, I think there's a lot of reasons for them to continue buying equipment. Um, it's just I wonder if the tax benefit isn't outweighing the uh, interest rate penalty that they're seeing. That's a good question. I, I think I, I don't think the tax benefit is is as big for the large fleets. I, I I don't know. I I, I don't. My, my my sense is it's the uh, the emissions pre buy that's that's the bigger factor. Um, when and you know these these are long term you know pieces of equipment and and so you know twenty twenty seven is not that far away in um, in fleet management terms. So that's my guess. Uh, you you could be right. It could be it, it could be um, a little bit both. Hmm. Hey, Tim, uh, one last question. I always like to ask you this one before we wrap up. Um, can you speak to the rate of cancellations and if we're seeing anything different year over year? 
That's a good question. I think cancellations have, have remained pretty low. And, and um, I think if anything, that, that one's probably not the best indicator because uh, because as, as uh, fleets start planning longer term, uh, they've become very reticent to give up their places in line. <laughs> uh, and so we just haven't seen a lot of cancellations. Um, and, and so um, the net order number does net out cancellations. So so when, when we talk about orders in general, we're, we're almost always talking net orders. So um, so that's really the, the number I focus on. Yeah. So your net number that you finalize in the middle of the month is net. Uh, and is that the same at the start of the month when you put out your preliminary numbers? It's net of cancellations? That's right. Yeah. Okay. We, we fine tune it a little bit mid month, but that's uh, the both net. Yeah, good. Any any um, thing to add on trailers? New trailer orders? Any trends there worth discussing? Well, yeah, trailer orders have been um, have been under pressure as well, and and, and I think there that relationship maybe healed a little bit sooner than the one with tractors. Uh, you know, from an economic perspective, as as we were just talking earlier, um, <clears throat> I think there's a bit of a if there you know, to the extent that there there is some pre buying. Uh, I think that pulls away from tractor uh, or trailer uh, spending budgets a, a little bit. So um, the uh, the trailer markets have, have certainly been under um, you know, trailer demands is, is pretty soft. We're, we've uh, we've come a long way from uh, expecting a, an ever expanding trailer to tractor ratio. Uh, you know, in the tight markets of a couple of years ago, that 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 kind of thinking is is pretty long gone. Excellent. Dean, you want to bring us home with some plugs? Yeah. Um, as always, day-to-day -day Wednesday with Dan Deegan tomorrow, 11 a.m. Uh, sales chatter. Robert Rouse is on Landline Now, as always, on Sirius XM Channel 146 Road Dog Radio. I'll be on with Jimmy Mack Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern talking about all things trucking. Um, our very own Cali Federer is talking to Chris Kaplis on the latest Freightvine podcast about using AI in rating. Uh, next week's show, we've got owner-operator Rico Muhammad back from Crescent Carriers in Atlanta talking about the latest trends uh, that small fleet owners are facing. Uh, don't forget Road Check Week is coming up around the corner, May 14 to 16. Uh, breaks and alcohol and control substances are the focus. Uh, that usually means um, uh, the, the, side, uh, the road, roadside inspections are going to be inside the cab. That's going to create a lot more um, out-of-service events, I suspect. Anytime you have breaks or anything like this, you see a higher number of carriers taking time off during that week. So this will be one of those years to watch uh, for uh, Road Check Week. Back to you, Ken, to wrap up the show. All right, Tim, how can folks get a hold of you or your content or what ACT is putting out? Well, we um, we will actually have a page linking linking us to DAT very soon, and and uh, we uh, actresearch.net is our site, and uh, and um, we we definitely appreciate the uh, the partnership uh, with with DAT, and um, yeah, always feel free to reach out. Yeah, awesome, appreciate it. Likewise, so I'm going to wrap up. I will be on the first flight out of Cleveland to Phoenix tomorrow. I have to fly American, which I'm just thrilled about. It's the only nonstop option. Um, but it's all right. I'm looking forward, like I said, to being with uh, this crowd. I think this will probably be my at least, at least my 10th TIA. I probably should have kept track because that would have been kind of ceremonial. But I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have a lot of DATers down there, um, a lot of our great customers and partners. So it should be a really, really good time as always. So with that, I'm going to sign off. We will see you next Tuesday yep. at 10 a.m. Eastern. I hope everyone has a great week and hope everyone can get the, give their eyes some rest. Don't look at the screens as much today because <laughs> – the Google searches for sore eyes today have went through the roof. So I encourage everyone to take it a bit easy today, um, coast to coast there. So okay. bye, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.